Marvel Sniper's both Terry Siegel and Bill Schuster, uh, who are the creators, the co creators of Superman. Uh, and starting there at least gives us a sense of like how this sort of culture begins and where it's where it originates from. Yeah, okay. Good. Well he checks out, I'll keep talking. <laughs> so so basically Bill Siegel and Schuster were nerds. Oh wow, that's so loud. I feel so powerful. It's incredible. It's, it's, all of this just fueling into me. All right, so these guys were nerds growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, right? And uh, Siegel in particular, uh, along with sort of a cohort of friends like Mort Weisinger, who would later go on to uh, edit comics and be a really significant force in comics, uh, were reading things like Amazing Stories from Hugo Gern's back and other pulps that you'll see you know, sort of displayed throughout here. And what they're doing is, is they're not just reading it, but they're forming clubs and they're developing what uh, we would now call fanzines and they're an early fan culture, right? And they're all communicating with each other across the country and they're developing sort of a sense of a group identity, right? And so Siegel and Schuster are reading these things and they're involved in all this stuff and they're writing these stories on their own. And not only are they reading and writing these stories, but they're watching a lot of Popeye cartoons. Right? They loved Popeye. So Siegel in particular is thinking about, when he creates Superman, is thinking about his own life and his own struggles in Cleveland, but also imagining what if Popeye lived in sort of the Amazing Stories universe, right? Uh, <clears throat> and that's, that's really where all this stuff comes from. So, so these guys get together and they, they formulate the, this idea and they can't get it sold. Nobody's buying it until these two gentlemen, uh, Jack Leibowitz on I Guess That's Your Right, uh, and Harry Donenfeld on the left, Donenfeld a sort of mobbed up fellow who got into publishing because it was a way to sort of hide money, um, decide to bite on the Superman idea and they publish it and it becomes this cultural phenomenon really without a lot of effort on, on their behalf. But they recognize that it's a cultural phenomenon and they start making all kinds of money on it uh, through licensing deals and, and on and on and on. Meanwhile, Siegel and Schuster, you know, get the short end of the stick for the most part. So all of this is happening after action comes out and, it, and that same sort of geeky, nerdy culture that is reading uh, Gernsback's pulps and a part of this, these fanzine communities is transferring that passion over into comics. And meanwhile, comics are drawing in a new, much younger audience who wants these sort of cartoon stories, right? Uh, so. So we get action, we get Superman, we get these ideas, right? And when Superman begins, he starts out as this sort of, for, for lack of a better term, sort of a social justice warrior, to put it in the parlance of our times, right? I mean, that's what he's really mostly interested in. Uh, and he has no compunctions about being incredibly violent. Um, so here, here uh, instead of fighting some sort of space ape or laser robot or something like that, Superman is spending his time beating up a wife beater. Uh, and this one, Superman, uh, has squared off against some ne'er-do-wells and uh, they fell off, uh, they tried to stab him, fell off a roof, and they're just a bloody smear on the pavement. And that's A-OK -okay for Superman. That's fine. They had it coming, really, is what he's saying. Like, they deserve this. If he hadn't tried to stab me, he'd still be alive right now. What an idiot, <laughs> right? So, so these, are the, these are the stories, though. This is the tenor of these things, right? And that's... And that's to do with a, a lot of different things. First of all, it's, it's what they're reading in the pulps, right? I mean, this is the spider, this is the shadow. I mean, these are characters that, you know, murder all the time, and that's fine for, for this audience, right? Um, but time, time progresses, and Superman sort of ebbs and flows in his popularity, and uh, superhero comics become this cultural phenomenon where almost everyone is reading them, uh, particularly GIs and uh, young boys. Well, World War II comes along and these GIs, they are coming back from war and superheroes aren't doing it anymore. It's not enough to see Captain America punch a Nazi anymore. That's, that's not emotionally satisfying and it doesn't match up with their real lived experiences either, right? So, so these kinds of comics start to appear. Uh, Lev, uh, crime Does Not Pay from Lev Gleason is the first really significant crime comic, right? There are of course crime pulp magazines and true crime and confession magazines all before this, but crime doesn't pay, uh, leaps onto the scene to be cute about it, and uh, is an immediate success, and so much a success that it spawns dozens and dozens and dozens of imitators just within the first few years of its existence. Um, so everyone starts churning out crime comics, and the reason that this happens is because 
publishers are predatory. They see a good idea, and then they rip, somebody has a good idea like Superman, and then every publisher in the business rips off that idea, right? Crime comics become a huge hit and a big money maker for Lev Gleason, so everybody starts producing crime comics, and, the, and that trend continues. I mean, it's still, that's comics culture today. It's just repetition and stealing ideas from one another. So, so these ideas, uh, so these kinds of comics become incredibly popular, and they, and they become popular for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the fact that they are just filled with gore and strange stories and people getting their, literally getting their faces melted off by stoves on the cover, right? I mean, that's, that's an everyday occurrence here. Uh, the more lurid, uh, the more lurid the cover, the more lurid the stories, the better it's sold. I mean, doesn't take Freud to figure that one out, right? So, so, this, is, so this is a big deal uh, throughout the 40s. But it's not just these that are selling. So this is a publisher, this is an interesting publisher, uh, EC Comics, originally uh, educational comics. And EC is kind of an interesting case because it was founded by Max Gaines who helped found the comics industry and was a major player at uh, DC Comics while before it was called DC and ushered in sort of this age of superheroes, right? Well, Max Gaines gets out, and he decides that he's going to funnel all of his cash into a new trend, and that trend is going to be kids' Bible stories and funny animal comics. Um, things are going, you know, the, the success is modest to be generous. Um, but, but it's successful enough for him to keep going. So, uh, and Max has made enough money on his superhero stuff to, to sort of keep these in print. Uh, and I'm using this specific example for a number of reasons, but not the least of which is that there's that whole section on the didactic artwork, right? I mean, it, the point of this is to say that this kind of artwork is a part of this culture, this community from jump. It's always there, it's always around. Um, so, Max, uh, so Max has this company and things are going okay. Uh, he has a son named Bill. Bill um, doesn't like his dad too much, doesn't want to be involved in comics, but... Um, Ends up being in comics anyway because Max Gaines is in a, gets in a horrible boating accident and is chopped up. Um, and then Bill has to take over the company. Uh, the problem is, for, for educational comics, is that uh, Bill does not, is not a religious fella and is not inclined to continue publishing these kinds of stories. First of all, he wants to make money. Second of all, he wants to sort of, because he had a strained relationship with his dad, he kind of wants to stick it to him and print the things that his dad would never print. Uh, so Bill, um, so Bill Gaines uh, decides to jump on the crime comics wave, and uh, this is a particularly famous cover. Uh, it was a center. It was one of the many centerpieces we'll talk about uh, of the crime of the uh, comic book, so-called comic book trials of uh, 1954. Bill sees an opportunity to make money, uh, so he and his writing partner and sometime artist Al Feldstein uh, start cranking out crime stories, war stories. Uh, and weird science fiction stories, and they're incredibly successful. They're doing really, I mean, they're just making tons of money. And the part of the reason they're making so much money and they're so successful is because they cultivated this sort of, uh, this group of artists who were exceptional in their field. They weren't just the average guys who were just looking for a job and eating eggs off of bathroom tiles, right? Which was a real thing that happened. Um, these guys were some of the very best in the field. And if they weren't the best in the field, they were soon to be. And, what, and Bill and Al Feldstein, they recognized this. And, and instead of trying to hide the artists or take credit away or sort of mask who was producing these things, they put the artists forefront. And then they started the EC fan club. And by putting the artists forefront and getting readers in touch with the artists, right? In the same way that readers felt in touch with the pulps by writing to pulp authors, by writing to Gernsback and all of these things, at EC, they're reconstructing that sort of fan culture, right? That obsessive sort of need to follow these characters, to follow these stories, to follow these artists around from book to book to book. And if you were a reader of EC Comics, you could follow a particular artist, right? Or you could follow just a particular line of comics that suited your sort of personal needs. So among those artists was this fella, Wallace Wood. Some people call him Wally. He hated being called Wally. We're going to call him Wallace. Wallace Wood, this picture's from the 70s, so he's a much older man then. Um, it's in his studio, he's, it's for photo reference stuff. Um, Wallace Wood was among those voices at EC, one of those sort of super incredibly talented artists that wasn't, had, hadn't hit it big yet, but by the time he starts working at EC, he's doing some of the most important work in comics history and of his career. Uh, and what 
what Wood sort of brings to the table for us in thinking about what's going on with the uh, Kelly and Shaw exhibit uh, is he's mostly interested in doing science fiction stories, and Wally Wood is heralding the science fiction line at EC, right? And one of the most significant sort of cultural contribu contributions that we get from Wood are the Mars Attacks aliens, right? You can see them right there. I mean, they're sort of the prototype of the Mars Attacks alien. Wood, prior to this, is always thinking about space, and, it, when, and for most of us, when we think of sort of that glass bubble helmet astronaut, I mean, that's a Wally Wood design, right? I mean, those are Wood's ideas. So, uh, so this appears here. Uh, there's how it appears in the story. I mean, there's our uh, attack, uh, Mars attacks Martians. Um, and eventually, this sort of mutates in the culture to these guys, right? And you'll see these. Uh, these are the tops cards. Um, this is not Wally Wood. This is Norman Saunders is the painter here. But you'll see these tops cards as a part of the exhibit, right? Uh, so we know, we can say that Kelly and Shaw are looking at these things. They know these things. And again, it's part of this sort of monster kid culture. Right? Where you grow up and you see these things. You know about the Topps cards. You know who Norman Saunders is. You know who Wally Wood is. Why? Because you're sort of inculcated in this fan identity that uh, wants you to understand all of these things. Wood also does something uh, else that's really interesting and useful for sort of observing the show. Uh, is where, it, where most people, many critics, credit Jack Kirby for inventing sort of the language of the superhero comic. Wally Wood gives it the grammar. Right? He's adding the commas and the periods and helping us make sense of those sentences to sort of refine it. Right? And he does things like this where he gives us the 22 panels that always work. And why do they always work? Because they, they're, they're iconic to us for some reason or another. We know what they mean sort of innately because we've either experienced them in film or on television or on a comic book page, but we all sort of have a shared experience. Right? So, so Wood is a powerful character in all of this. Uh, and here he's uh, doing crime stories. Um, but, <clears throat> but the thing with EC is that what Gaines wanted to do was to sort of continue pushing the envelope. How much more blood and gore and weirdness can we get on the page? How much more money can we make, right? So the answer to that, the a partial answer to that, is through the horror genre, right? So we'll see some uh, particularly uh, beautiful, I think, uh, Jack Davis covers, right? So they start producing the horror genre, right? Which is a part of that sort of weird science fantasy uh, sort of world, right? But it's taking it another step further. And what they're doing is they're taking an idea that comes from Crime Does Not Pay Earlier, and they're introducing us to the horror host, right? Now, the horror host exists in other media prior to comics, but comics sort of make it famous, right? It gives us a sort of, that's sort of the archetypal version of this, is the Crypt Keeper, Right? So when we get to, by the time we get to Tales from the Crypt and we get these stories, uh, again, we're sort of reinforcing this cultural identity, this sort of fan identity. Uh, there's another Jack Davis cover. Um, and they're all sort of obsessed with this grotesqueness, right? Uh, the stranger, the weirder it looks, the more violent it is, the more appealing it's uh, necessarily going to be. <clears throat> now, the next thing that EC tries is Harvey Kurtzman, who was producing EC's war line. He was the editor and uh, uh, consistent artist on the series, or at least writer uh, on the series, decides he wants to get into the humor business because that's how he sort of saw himself. So they put together Mad Magazine. Uh, and I don't, if I have to tell you what Mad Magazine is, I feel like you might need to go home and start over, right? We all know what Mad is. So. So, but this is, where, this is where MAD comes from, from this sort of same culture, these artists that are trying to create this particular identity that Bill, and Max, or that Bill Gaines and Al Feldstein are trying to sort of curate, right? Uh, and within that, here's more Wally Wood. And, the, in the, <clears throat> and this is one of the early sort of MAD stories, the Super Duper Man piece. And it's worth pointing to because, it, again, it reminds us that all of these things are sort of reflexive, right? They're always interested in their own past, their own identity, and how do we reshape that, and how do we mock that, and how do we, have, how do we create a vocabulary that only we understand, right? You're creating a culture. Um, so, and Wood is, Wally Wood is, of course, a, a significant part of that, or Wallace Wood, excuse me. Uh, but they're not alone in producing these horror comics. Horror comics, like crime comics before them, were incredibly successful, uh, and in, and inspired, you know, incalculable, well, probably calculable, uh, imitators. <laughs> and, and among them, uh, but among the artists contributing to those was this fella, uh, Basil Wolverton, uh, who was also in your guide as one of our sort of marquee names for, the, for our artists. Uh, Wolverton starts out 
sort of just schlepping around at different comic book houses and producing whatever needed to be produced. Weird science fiction, horror, superheroes, whatever, whatever he was gonna get paid for that day. Uh, and, but his work had a, a certain sort of strangeness to it, right? He's always interested in like making things as grotesque and weird as possible. Again, sort of playing right into the hands of that like burgeoning monster culture, right? So uh, on the left, these are both Wolverton drawings. On the left, the, there's the moon men who are there to conquer uh, Earth, as it were. And then on the right, there, those are brain bats, and they are bats that are basically octopuses. Um, but also have giant brains and land on your head and then take over your brain and they're here to conquer the planet, right? For, for Wolverton, the stranger, the more grotesque something is, the more captivating it is. And, the, and frankly, the funnier it is, right? It, it, every time you turn around when you see a Basil Wolverton drawing, he's trying to get you to go, oh, right? And that's funny to him. And, and it is funny to me too, right? I think it's really funny. But these become sort of artistic sort of hallmarks, they become part of the vocabulary. Like you know what a Wolverton drawing looks like. And when you walk around and you'll see some of the drawings up here, you'll see those same Basil Wolverton teeth, right? They're all mangled and snarled and just ugh, right? That's a part of the language. <clears throat> but things sort of come to a head uh, in 1954 with the um, comic book trials uh, and this story amongst others, uh, particularly many of those uh, Tales from the Crypt cover covers and uh, crime suspense stories um, become sort of centerpieces to the argument against comics and the sort of the deleterious motives and, and elements to them. So this is a story um, drawn by Jack Cole, who, if you know comics, is the creator of Plastic Man, but he also did a lot of pinup art for like Playboy magazine. He did uh, a lot of stuff uh, sort of in a uh, Archie type vein, incredible cartoonist. Um, but. Uh, Cole does a story called Murder, Morphine, and Me, and it's about a woman who is addicted to morphine uh, and then gets a morphine needle jabbed into her eye. Um, there it is, in case you couldn't see it down at the bottom. Um, this is, I mean, this is the stuff that's sold to kids, right? I mean, this is, off, this is off the newsstand. You throw down your 20, 30 cents, and you grab a couple of copies of this, and you take it out in the woods, and you talk to your friends about it, and it's a fun time, right? You roast some potatoes. It's a great day. Uh, so... But, but, this, but this sort of injury to the eye motif, the violence, the, the inherent sexism, all of those things become sort of the forefront of the conversation, right? And, and, and conservative groups become really worried about this. Parent-teacher organizations, religious organizations, uh, it, it becomes front of mind for a lot of people. And because of that, the Comics Code Authority is developed, and it works sort of like the Hayes Code, if you know films, except it's much more stringent. Um, and that changes the way that comics are produced. And that, as a part of those changes, publishers like EC could no longer title their comics what they were titled. They couldn't have words like horror, terror, monster, wolfman, any of those things, even in the titles of their comics, much less the content, right? So that, that dramatically changes the publishing landscape. And although these sort of uh, stringent rules were voluntary, if you didn't abide by them, you couldn't get your comics distributed, right? And if you can't get your comics distributed, then you're out of business. So What's it going to be, right? Um, and for larger publishing houses like National and DC, they start doing something a little bit different. Uh, they, the stories become much tamer. They're a little more milk toast, right? Superman's not throwing land, and this, is, this change has been coming for quite a while, but Superman's not throwing landlords out of buildings. He's not beating up wife beaters. Instead, uh, we get more introspective stories because Jerry Siegel's writing more sort of psychologically and dealing with some more of his own stuff on the page. But, uh, but, the, work, but the artwork changes pretty substantially and the, and the content of the stories changes substantially. Um, so what would happen here is Mort Weisinger, who was the editor at, at uh, National at the time, would have a cover drawn up and then a story would be written based on the cover, right? Or a splash page would be drawn up and then the story is written based on that splash page. So a lot of times you get these goofball stories where Superman has a lion's head. Why, how'd he get a lion's head? Nobody knows. Find out inside. Where did this giant super ape from space come from with kryptonite lasers for eyes? Don't know. Find out inside. But they become very they become much more innocent, right? There's something complex, there's something deep psychologically going on with them, but on the surface, they're very plain, they're very milk toast, they're very palatable to children, right? This is not the crime comics, the, the horror comics, or even the romance comics that are trying to appeal to a much more adult audience in the 40s and 50s. So, and for certain segments of, the, of comics readership, that's fine, 
That's great, let's keep doing it. These are great goofball stories, and there's some, there's some terrific stuff in there. But not everyone is satisfied with that, and a lot of people aren't satisfied with that. So, so some changes start to happen. One of the things that happens, so that MAD, so that EC can survive, MAD changes from a comic book format to a magazine format. And by changing to a magazine format, uh, they could avoid the comics code. If we're a magazine, then we're different, we're a different kind of publication, and nobody's going to censor us because we're governed by different rules. We're not in the CMAA anymore. We're not a part of the comics magazine publishers. We're just magazines, right? So Mad's doing this, uh, and then uh, a fellow by the name, uh, or publisher by the name of Jim Warren comes along. Warren uh, was a reader and a fan of the old EC comics. He loved the horror comics, he loved crime, he loved all of those things. Um, and what Warren wanted to do in the early 1960s was bring back those stories, right? I mean, it's a sense of nostalgia. It's moving backwards. Let's, let's try horror again. And now that we, the precedent has been set where if we publish these as a magazine, then we can do basically whatever we want. And that's what he does. So Warren, uh, Warren's publishing house starts out with this magazine, Creepy, uh, and the cover's by Jack Davis, who did all those delightful horror covers for us before. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's a great piece, and it brings back the horror host, and all of these things that are part of that sort of vocabulary, that monster kid vocabulary, right? It's all back there on the page. Uh, creepy is, a, after this, uh, Creepy becomes a success, uh, there's another one, and a lot of these covers are by Frank Frazetta, um, who hopefully you're at least mildly aware of. Um, after Creepy's a success, they launch a sister title called Eerie, which is basically doing the same thing. And what's great about these comics, about Eerie and Creepy, is that, is that Warren isn't just trying to sort of emulate the old uh, EC horror and crime and weird suspense comics, right? He's going back and he's, he's mining those old artists and bringing them back into the fold and saying, come back here, I can't pay you a lot, but you're gonna be able to do these kinds of stories that you always wanted to do and that you were so great at, right? So Jack Davis comes back, so Wallace Wood comes back, and, uh, and on down the line, you know, Joe Orlando, um, Graham Ingalls, uh, just down the line. I mean, all of them come back at some point and work for Jim Warren, right? But Warren does, is smart, though, and he starts including more contemporary artists that were not just popular at the time, but were also readers of those comics. So you get to see more uh, Steve Ditko and Neil Adams uh, and, and uh, those of their ilk. And they're coming back and they're doing these stories again. Uh, but Warren doesn't, doesn't just stop there with this sort of monster kid identity. Uh, he introduces Vampirella, which it appeals to these readers for any number of reasons, not the least of which are the, you know, mildly lurid covers, right? This is going to sell to a 17-year-old kid who wants vampires, who wants monsters, and wants sex, right? I mean, it's not, it's not hard math, right? Um, and he also... but. As a part of that culture, knowing his audience, he introduces famous monsters of Filmland too, right? Which is a, a sort of polished fanzine for the kids who were growing up watching Universal Monster movies and then would later go on to watch Roger Corman movies or in love with every, you know, B-horror picture that stars John Agar or whatever it is, right? I mean, this is, this is, these are Warren's people, right? So there's a Basil Gogos cover from Famous Monsters. Um, Warren also is interested, just like EC, in humor. And who does he bring back? Harvey Kurtzman, the inventor of MAD, to produce Help. Uh, and this uh, Help, for its short run, was uh, edited by Gloria Steinem. And this is, but this is the weird one, um, because Warren wants to do, I mean, he really just wants to do EC, right? So he, so he tries this comic, Blazing Combat, and it is, in advertisements, he even calls it part of their new trend, I mean, adopting the EC language. Uh, and he wants these stories to be as realistic as possible, just in, this, in a way very similar to Harvey Kurtzman's, the realism of Harvey Kurtzman's uh, war stories at EC. So this is interesting, though, because this comic only lasts for four issues. And the reason it only lasts for four issues is because it was really anti-war. Uh, and it's being produced in 1965, so it's before the anti-Vietnam War movement has really uh, taken hold of the uh, uh, popular consciousness. But Warren's doing this in 1965, and he's telling all these anti-war stories. And what happens to him, and what happens to the magazine, is that first, uh, Army PX says ban it. You can't buy it from 
the military PX, okay? Well, that's not enough to, to wreck the magazine, right? Well, then the, uh, as the story goes, the military sort of conspires with its uh, friends in the American Legion, and they, inc and they start encouraging distributors to not carry it. Uh, and when distributors, as, as, uh, as comics publishers learned in the 50s, if distributors aren't carrying your work, you're out of business. And Warren was losing thousands of dollars upon the, uh, thousands upon thousands of dollars on Blazing Combat, just over its four issue run. Um, and it got to the point where he could no longer afford to, even with his super cheap, shoddy printing practices, he could no longer afford to uh, keep, it, keep it going and drops it, right? But it's still part of that culture. Uh, and as, as a part of that sort of, but Warren's not alone in, in imitating the success that, that EC created, right? They, comics publishers are in business to make as much money as they can. So DC Comics um, brings readers humor stories with Plop, and that is another Basil Wolverton cover, right? So Plop becomes a hit and uh, hires all sorts of... Uh, you know, this, the same sort of merry band of idiots are working on these things. Cracked is the same thing. Um, Cracked, I mean, before it was a listicle website, was a very popular humor satire magazine, right? Uh, and, and sorry, the image is so blurry here, but what Cracked does, and you'll, again, this, I pulled this particular image uh, because you'll see something like this mimicked upstairs. Uh, Cracked, with its artist John Severin, who also worked at EC and worked on Mad and worked on the horror titles and all of those things, um, was particularly fond of doing these sorts of TV spoofs, right? With the, with the typeface lettering and all those things. I mean, so when you go upstairs and you see some of the stuff, I mean, that's a John Severin piece. There's a Dick Van Dyke uh, satire up there. I mean, that's John Severin that they're, that they're aping, right? That's Cracked Magazine that they're aping. Um, so it's not just Dell, it's not just DC, but Marvel Comics does this too. They have their own sort of, they have their own humor magazines, just like everybody had humor magazines after Mad came out. Um, but Marvel does something interesting because they want to get in on this horror magazine racket that Warren sort of drummed up. So they create their own imprint for horror magazines uh, and start introducing uh, more monster characters there and also use it to publish their Conan the Barbarian stories, which again, they want to fill as, with as much lurid sex and violence as they can because that's what sells Conan stories, right? Um, so, they, so they create this magazine imprint to do just that. Uh, and DC gets into the, get, into the racket, too, with Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby's Spirit World is a little bit different, though. It's a really short-lived series, but what Spirit World does is it's trying to take this whole sort of hidden world sort of subculture and put it on the page and then sort of blend it with comics. So it's part comics, it's part uh, real stories of the supernatural and prophecy and all those things. Um, it's a, it's a strange, strange comic, but really tremendously interesting. Uh, it's collected um, in some places if, if you want to track it down, but it's, it's, a, it's a weird book. It's kind of like Unsolved Mysteries, but with comics. Um, strange book. But the point is, is that all of these publishers are sort of ripping this, they're, they're ripping the same idea off, and they keep doing it over and over and over again. Why are they doing it? Because there is this subculture that is out there that are reading these things, that are devouring them, right? I mean, they're the people that are today 45 and 50 years old buying vinyl kaiju at comic book conventions. I know this because I'm friends with many of these people, and I buy those kaiju too, right? It's, a, it's the same folks. There's a sort of created identity there. Um, but so, here, so here's the interesting thing, though is that it's not just these stories that, that are getting told. So when you see the hidden world stuff up there, uh, as a part of the sort of monster subculture, there's also this uh, strange strand of didacticism and this obsession with finding weirdo religious stuff. Uh, and as a part of that, in the collection up there, uh, there's a lot of work from this fellow, who I, is my primary sort of research subject, and that's Steve Ditko. Uh, Ditko is the co-creator of Spider-Man and the sole creator of um, Doctor Strange, and it's sole creator regardless of what anybody says. Um, trust me. Uh, so, but anyway, so Ditko, so Ditko's an interesting cat, though, because by the time the mid-60s roll around and he's left Spider-Man and he's left Doctor Strange, he starts doing these really didactic comics, uh, and he creates this uh, character that's, that's a, a creator-owned character, which is to say everything self-published, uh, called Mr. A. And with Mr. A, uh, Ditko develops something that he calls the right to kill. And this is in direct opposition to the Comics Code Authority. He thinks that superheroes have the right to kill, or the, at, least to, at least that they don't have to save 
bad guys. Just in the same way, the comics that he was reading as a kid, those early Superman comics, when Superman lets that guy fall off the roof and splatter, Ditko thinks that that's, that's the norm. That's how things should be. That is the ethical approach to all of this. And he wants his readers to understand that and creates these didactic comics to that, very, to that end. So this is the cover to Mr. A number one, which is upstairs. Um, and in this story, this is the first time Ditko has, somebody ki has a superhero kill someone, which is a big deal. Uh, it happens in 1967, and they hadn't been doing that for a long time, certainly not on purpose. It's much more, it was always ambiguous. It's not ambiguous here. Um, so these two characters, The Question and Mr. A, I mean, they're effectively the same thing, but they serve a, a, a similar didactic purpose, right? They serve a, a, a sort of quasi-religious purpose. Um, and I, and I mean that very much. I mean, Ditko becomes invested in the writing of Ayn Rand and, and starts going to the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, Institute and gets sort of inculcated into this cult of personality around Brandon and Rand and around these ideas, right? And wants to sort of spread the gospel, as it were, in really fascinating and bizarre ways. Um, so here's how the right to kill works for him. And again, this is one of the stories that's in those comics upstairs. Uh, in this story, Mr. A shows up. Uh, these kidnappers have kidnapped a little girl for reasons that I can't quite remember and really don't matter, but they've kidnapped a little girl. Uh, Mr. A shows up and puts a bullet in the head of one of the kidnappers, and that's it. The end. He, takes the, he grabs the girl, walks out, everything's cool. Uh, that's the point of the story, is to teach you this lesson, that it was right for him to do that. Um, and in uh, issues like this, He's directly addressing the comics code, saying that this is the way it's supposed to be. Um, violent, it, violence is not what it, what's at stake here, right? Because that was one of the major sort of complaints about comics, that they were so violent. And he's saying, no, violence isn't what's at stake. It's that we're questioning your moral code, right? Because we question your moral code, you tried to silence us. Uh, and this is his effort to sort of bring that back around. Uh, here's Mr. A letting someone die, uh, another ne'er-do-well die again plummets inward into the city, uh, again, bloody smear in the pavement as superheroes are wont to do. Um, but Ditko's not alone in this sort of didacticism, and when, in, and when readers are finding these sorts of things, they're not just finding them in the sort of weird underground self-published comics that Wallace Wood is putting out, that Steve Ditko is producing. Ditko's putting it in mainstream DC comics too, like Hawk and Dove. Uh, if you know Hawk and Dove, or you only know Hawk and Dove from the 80s or the early 90s, that's a different Hawk and Dove than these two. Um, these two are an interesting pair. So the basic premise of Hawk and Dove is that Hawk is a very violent, uh, rough and tumble, um, action first type guy. Dove, his brother, is not quite a pacifist, will fight, but only when he has no other options. And the premise of the comic is that neither one of these heroes is any good on their own. They have to be able to work together and find a balance between them. And how do you find that balance? Ah, there's an answer for you. Just, just turn inside, right? So inside, there you find out that their dad, a judge, is a sort of moral center for the both of them and works uh, in the way, it works as a sort of conduit of reason, right? They're always sort of navigating the boundaries between these two spaces, right? How do we figure out who's right and who's wrong here? Well, we search, in, we search inside of ourselves, we use our rationality, we use our reason, and that's how it works. The, and we come up with the correct answer, the inevitably ethical answer, if you're rational, right? Um, so, I mean, and Hawk and Dove, I mean, they're a hit. I mean, Showcase uh, was, a play, was a tryout book, uh, and if the characters were a hit, then they got their own series. Hawk and Dove got their own series. Ditko worked on it for a few issues before he got sick uh, and had to leave uh, DC for a short period of time. So, but as I started to say before, Ditko's not alone in this sort of didacticism, right? This sort of like intensity of sort of religious thought, like we're right, we're, we, and we know this. We have, we have access to absolute truth. Um, and a part of this sort of uh, same subculture that's reading these comics and loves monsters is also discovering Jack Chick. Um, do you all know who Jack Chick is? If you, know, if you don't know who Jack Chick is, I'm, at some point in your life, you're going to encounter one of these tracks, like in a men's room or like in a gutter somewhere, or someone who's ordinarily like selling pencils from a cup is going to force one into your hand, right? And you're going to look at it and go, oh my God, what is this? Uh, because they are strange and bizarre and hateful and um, uncompromising uh, in ways that I think would make most people squeamish. 
Um, but, they're, but they're trying to serve that sort of same purpose uh, as, the, as the Ditko objectivist work is. They're trying to save you, right? These, these tracks, whatever you think of their politics, whatever you think of their sort of religious outlook, they're trying to save you very earnestly um, and uh, in bizarre ways. So, and they became, they, not only they're sort of part of the subculture anyway, people know of them, but they become really sort of at the for, forefront of it when this track down here at the bottom left, Dark Dungeons, comes out because it is the D&D, it's an infamous Jack Chick, Jack Chick tract uh, about the dangers of Dungeons and Dragons and why you shouldn't play. And that it's about a girl who uh, plays too much, she gets too involved with her character, and then turns herself over to uh, Satan to become a bride of Satan. And she can only be saved by the power of Jesus Christ at the end. Um, and at, at the end of all of these tracks, there is even, uh, there's an opportunity for you, the reader, to uh, turn yourself over and become a Christian. And then the way that you do that is you check a box. And then you sign it, and then you date it. As though people have shoe boxes of these at home, and they're going to be thumbing through, and they're going to pull them out. Here is the day. This is the one. This is the one that saved me. Lisa saved me. Maybe, right? But that's, that's the idea here, right? And this, the re <laughs> these kids involved in this stuff, we all knew what this was, right? We might not have had easy access to them uh, in the pre-internet pre days, but we all knew what they were, and we all sort of sought them out. When we found them, they were it's like gold, right? You got to hang on to this. This is powerful. This is important. It's so strange. It's wrong. It's gross. It's taboo. It's weird, right? Even though that's not the intent, but that's what it is. Um, and for the sake of time, I won't explain all of these, but uh, if anyone has questions later, I'll, uh, I'll talk through some of these stories because, they, I mean, they're really disturbing, uh, incredibly disturbing. There's nothing, there's nothing not disturbing about any of them. Um, but for laughs, at least, uh, I'll show you something from Party Girl here to give you a sort of a sense of what's on the inside of these things. Uh, so Party Girl Jill, I think her name's Jill. Yes, Party Girl Jill uh, just likes to go out and have a good time, and she doesn't know that by going out and having a good time, she's putting her soul in peril every time she, that she sips a martini. Um, so she gets invited to this party, and the bartender is there, and it's a costume party, and the bartender is holding up a mask, and that mask is the devil. When the bartender removes his mask, who's there? You guessed it, Satan, right? Satan is there wearing a Satan mask, trying to steal her soul for who? Satan, right? And, and it just goes on and on like this, like it spirals like this over and over again, and they're always, there's always some sort of supposed scriptural evidence for this, right? But these tracks go on and on. They're deeply concerned about Catholicism. They are deeply concerned about uh, LGBTQ lifestyles. I mean, just you name it, right? Any sort of host of radical um, Protestant views are, are within these pages. Um, but again, the culture knows about these things and it obsesses over them, right? Not because not because we like them, but because they're so strange, because they are anti us, right? Or they were anti that community. Um, but it's not just the strange and the bizarre and the frightful sort of Jack Chick tracks that are out there. Basil Wolverton gets in on this racket too, uh, produces the Wolverton Bible. Um, and it's this gorgeously illustrated Bible. Um, and it was recently reproduced. Uh, and it's just the Old Testament in the book of Revelation, as I think you can see on there. Um, but Wolverton takes these things and takes them seriously. Uh, this is a scene from Revelation and what happens there, right? And it's in that, very much in that uh, EC horror or you know, low rent horror comic grotesque style, right? That is right there sort of feeding and cycling back through, right? We start in the beginning with Max Gaines publishing his Bible comics and we move into those horror comics. And by the time we get to the end of it in the 70s, uh, so we're right back where we started, right? Except now those Bible comics are infused with something else. They're infused with this separate subculture, this separate identity that's trying to sort of exert itself there and be a part of that conversation. And there's something value about, valuable about that. Uh, because ultimately what it leads us to, and I just pulled this off the, off the internet, but it ultimately it leads us to this kind of art, right? It leads us to this kind of community, this culture that wants to ask about these things and wants to obsess over these things um, and creates an identity. I mean, this is, the, this is the early sort of cosmopolitan space of the punk rock scene before punk rock is a thing, when it's still just anti-rock or, or it's noise rock. Or whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter, right? But that's where this is, that's who these folks are, right? Uh, and I think that that's really valuable and interesting for 
all of us, because it's, it speaks to sort of a strand of culture that we, you might not know, but it's definitely there. So that's what I've got. Thank you. Questions? Anybody? Bueller? Yo. When did they to overturn the law when, where, where you can't, like, so the CPO's killing? Uh, okay, so it was never actually a law, right? It's not like, it's no, it was never anything in the legal sense. It was a voluntary system of self-censorship. Um, so, and it never, it never gets overturned, but by 2002, 2003, early 2000s, uh, no comics publisher was using was sending stuff to the code authority anymore. And, uh, because A, first of all, the code is so impotent by that point to be useless. Most companies had their own sort of regulatory rating system in place. Uh, and B, um, at post Ditko, when he, start, when he has the question kill people, um, the, the code regulations start to loosen, not just because of what he did, but because there are things happening in sort of media that are making that um, a more desirable element to be able to include in your comics, right? So. Uh, by the time Ditko has the question killing people and then the Punisher shows up, I mean, this superheroes don't kill thing, I mean, that's basically out the window. Uh, and they're doing it all the time. So the code sort of loosens up its rules and authority. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. But, but it, it, it was never a law, but it finally fully disappears by early 2000s. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yes. Oh, that's Baphomet? That, yeah. Every time, so I, I have this one, I have this chick tract, uh, and uh, every time I read, I hear it in Jackie Mason's voice. Um, so, but, uh, but anyway, so that's Baphomet. That one is a chick tract that is warning you, dear reader, that things that you might find to be mundane, uh, ordinary, are actually, might actually be uh, Satan trying to trap you and damn your eternal soul to hell. Um, so every time you turn around, like maybe the ingredients in your cereal, that's Baphomet? Baphomet's in the cereal, Baphomet's in the cereal, right? I mean, it's, that's, it's not precise, that's not exactly the content of the story, but it's that sort of idea, right? Like Satan is always out there trying to get you, and the only way that you can sort of achieve salvation is by turning yourself over right now after you read this, sign your name, date it, check the box, and then you're good, right? So, um, so the, the premise is that he's just always around, just the, just the same as in Party Girl. He's just hanging out at the party. You think you're just having a martini when hanging out with your friends. No, 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 you've put your mortal soul in peril, right? That's, that's basically the premise there. I know it sounds weird because, it, and listen, it, it sounds weird because it's super weird. <laughs> um, but if, you're, if you have any interest in these things uh, and sort of their nonsense uh, to be... I don't need to be kind or polite or fair about this. I mean, it's nonsense. Um, they're all available for free on the Jack Chick website. And you can send them $10 and you'll get a subscription box and they will send you everything that they have in print and then you'll get new ones every month. So, anyway, yes. Hi, I just have a comment. There was a visitor here who said that she actually saw those tracks when she was growing up in Mexico. Oh, yeah. Like in Spanish. Yeah. 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 She recognized them right away. Yeah, they, they exist in several different languages. So I, yeah. I was uh, on a research trip to New York this summer, and uh, in Times Square, someone had a huge table of these things in uh, at least a dozen different languages. So I, and they're all free, of course, because salvation is free. So you go, and <laughs> so I went, and I picked up as many as I could in as many different languages as I could. But yeah. And then I have a question. We were told that, um, that Jim Shaw was um, influenced by Wayne Bo Boring. Yes. Illustrated Superman. Can you talk a little bit more about Wayne Boring and maybe about the work of Jim Shaw that's supposedly you know, influenced by that? So those are him? Wayne Boring drawings. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit about Jim Shaw's connection with him and what's uh, his significance that's a, as an illustrator? Uh, so Boring is the Superman artist of the 1950s. Uh, by that time, uh, Jerry Siegel uh, is, has come back and is writing off and on when he can get the work, and uh, 
Schuster is basically gone because he's effectively blind. Um, but Siegel's writing is writing a lot of these, and Wayne Boring is working on them uh, and developing a lot and co-developing a lot of these ideas. So, um, so upstairs, like a lot of the Superman art that you'll see is very influenced by the way that Boring sort of sculpted the character, uh, the S and those things. I mean, those are those aren't quite Boring innovations, but they are. Uh, a sort of a hallmark of his work early on, right? Prior to this in the 40s and before the, the, the shield, sort of the uh, build of the character is a little bit different, right? So I think you'll see, see it largely in the anatomy, um, but uh, also in sort of the content, I mean, the goofball content is, is there too. So, and the sort of strangeness of it all. That, at least that, that's what I observed in it when I saw it. Your mileage may vary. Anybody else? Anybody? Yeah. I think he wants to hang on. I think he wants to see you talking to Mike. Um, those um, didactic ones were uh, the, they the chick tracks? Um, the or the the ones check like box? Uh, yeah, the chick tracks. Yeah. Yeah, these. Yes, those. Um, were the fans more into the comfort of checking the boxes or just experiencing through the horror, or uh, the uh, strange story? I, I, I think that's going to depend on sort of your r religious footing, right? So for someone like me that buys these things or collects them or looks for them in gutters, I'm looking for them because they are so strange and weird. Right, and not because I think that there's anything of any sort of intellectual value in them, but there's, some, there's something strange about having the object, right? But for Chick and the people that are producing these comics with them, they mean it, like they're serious. They want you to read it, they want you to check the box, they want you to be saved. Regardless of what anyone, any one of us thinks of that, the politics in there, I mean, they, he is genuinely, he feels that he is demonstrating genuine care and worry about your immortal soul. Uh, I think that I think that most fans that read these things that, buy, that so there's a there's a famous comic shop in, in Chicago called Quimby's, okay, and it's sort of an underground shop and they sell um, independent comics and just weirdo fan magazines and that sort of thing, right? And they sell chick tracks too, right? And they're selling chick tracks and they sell them for a quarter a piece and they sell chick tracks because they are expecting you to come in and look at it and go, man, this shit is crazy, and then put it in your pocket and walk out and then share it with your friends because it's so flipping crazy. Right, so that is the unintended audience, but that's, I think that's the largest audience, right? I don't imagine that there are many people out there that pick these things up and go, my life has changed, and they have this great epiphany, right? Uh, it's mostly, it's, it's a cultural oddity. Anybody else? Feel good? I feel good. Oh, yeah. Do they still sell what? These? Oh yeah, they still sell, there's still new chick tracks that come out. Jack's, uh, I don't know if Jack's dead or not. Um, he might be dead. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but, there's, but new chick tracks do come out, yeah. There, there you go, see? Just two years ago, year and a half. But anyway, but, they, but new chick tracks still come out, you can still, you can still get your hands on them. And in fact, they, he, he co-wrote a book called Hot Topics about some of the hottest, most controversial chick tracks and uh, to ex sort of explain where the stories came from and why, they thought, why he thought they were so valuable and that sort of thing. So, I mean, he was active right up until his death, as far as that stuff goes. But his ministry sort of continues. And, and I'd add, too, uh, they didn't just do these tracks, these things that you find in the gutter or in bathrooms. They produced regular full-size full comics as well that were, that were Bible stories and also sort of cautionary tales about the dangers of Catholicism and things like that. You know. So, yeah, they're, they're very real. They're very easily accessible. Um, and if you have the stomach, if you have the stomach, see what's going on with Lisa. Uh, it's, 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 it's a painful one, and, it's, uh, and it exemplifies exactly why these things became objects of scrutiny and scorn and ironic collection, uh, just the same as the Dark Dungeons one did. Those two tracks right there are the sort of epitome of why weirdo culture is, is interested in them because they're, they're, they're bad news, right? There's nothing nice about them. I mean, we might be able to laugh about them, but there's nothing nice about them. Um, and because there's, there's so much taboo stuff going on in there, that makes them appealing for this 
strange audience. Okay, sure. Right now, right now it stands for Detective Comics, which is what it stood for before, I guess. So. Well, okay, so it's a long story. I'll make this brief so that we can wrap this up. But it was National Periodical Publications, and then they changed the name to DC Comics. That's, that's the short version, right? Because DC was a more saleable name. And also, that was the name that the company had when um, uh, Leibowitz orchestrated the merger between DC and their, uh, and their distribution houses with Warner Brothers, right? That wasn't a buyout, that was a merger that Leibowitz helped orchestrate, so, in the 70s. All right. Yeah, no, it's definitely Detective Comics, and it comes from the, the line, from the, the, the Detective Comics series. You're welcome, glad to answer. Anybody else? All right, thank you all so much for your time and your attention.